What's up, everybody? How's it going this evening? I sat down to do a, a few voice recordings for a upcoming video I was going to make down the road, and uh, I just couldn't uh, couldn't do it until I made this one. And uh, this video that I've been thinking about this all day, I watched a. I, I've been really fascinated with the mind for you know as long as I can remember. Um, understanding the mind-body problem, the placebo effect, and how we can manifest illnesses as well as cure them, um, but also the mind itself and what it means to be conscious. This is a subject that is pretty much impossible to tackle. I mean, in uh, there's so many different scientific fields that deal with the brain and with awareness and with intelligence, but when it comes to consciousness itself, it's just kind of one of those things we have to shake our heads at. Not that we can't define it, or that we'll never explain it, but rather that uh, being conscious means that we're the observer, observing ourselves being conscious. So, uh, I had this kind of theory about what consciousness may be, if you will, which is a pretty bold statement, of course, and I'm sure it falls in line with plenty of other people who have had similar thoughts, but let's just start here. Okay, so can we create new senses? A person who is blind, for example, they learn to use their hearing, um, and a lot of people who have been blind for most of their life get around pretty well. There have been people who have been blind for most of their life who, especially this one particular guy who had a surgery to restore his eyesight, and he couldn't make sense of the world after the surgery was done. To him, all of the shapes he was seeing had no association in his brain because everything he knows is what he feels, smells, and hears, and tastes. So even years later he still has a hard time getting around and actually seeing what things are. And it's it's because your vision picks up on certain cues that you have spent a lifetime trying to understand. So one glimpse of a room it tells you a completely different story than a different person, depending on your experiences with the types of cabinets, what's on the counters, um, the flooring, every single aspect of it. And generally, we don't talk about those things, we just go about our lives. It's impossible to define what another person's consciousness really is. But as far as like having different senses and using our senses like that uh, to replace other ones, it's pretty fascinating. There have been studies where people are wearing, for example, an outfit which picks up on the sounds around you and causes vibrations in the suit uh, to, that go along to certain sounds. And after a period of a couple weeks, the people begin to develop circuitry within their brains that can read these vibrations and it, it becomes another sense, if you will. It's impossible to define because we can't imagine what it's like to have another sense. But your brain, neuroplasticity, is the ability of your brain to develop any area of expertise you need, and there are physical brain changes, physical changes that take you know place on the brain that you can see when a person is, say, a musician, um, or a person who is super violent tends to have a, a different, uh, not all of people, but uh, let's just put it this way, your brain can tell you a lot about if we could read it properly about the individual. So, we've been studying basically areas of the brain and trying to understand, okay, where's consciousness? Is it over here, over here? And I think most of us uh, who've, you know, looked at the available evidence um, have started to wonder if consciousness may just be a system that is present and forms... okay. <laughs> First off, let's start off with, with the, the, the whole the brain itself, um, the connectome of the brain. We have uh, 86 billion neurons and trillions of connections in the brain. No specific area deals with one memory or another, or, well, I should say memories perhaps, but um, no particular area deals with consciousness itself, where you can just remove consciousness. We can um, put a person under... Uh, when they have, say, an anesthetic, when they're having an operation, it's one of the most interesting things, because the question is, where do you go? Where does your consciousness go? Well, it just ceases to be for a little while. And a lot of folks can compare it to dreaming. 
the interesting thing is that for dreaming, and this was the question that I was kind of posing and would lead into what my theory is, I've heard people say this plenty of times, to say, you know, well, perhaps this is just a dream, this waking life that we're in, and that we will wake up to a more coherent reality after this life. And they make the comparison to when you're in a dream, you're not aware that you're in the dream. And a lot of strange things happen, and then you wake up, and you're like, oh, it was just a dream. And they say, so what if we wake up out of this life, and it's very similar. And uh, I mentioned that to my wife, and when she, she said the exact same thing that I was thinking when I was you know, writing it down. Uh, she said, well, what about lucid dreaming? Because I used to do a lot of lucid dreaming. At least once a week I'd have a lucid dream where I'd go into my dream, be aware I was dreaming, I could fly, manifest things in my dreams. It was pretty amazing. And so my thought was this. What if, and this isn't my theory, but what if, let's say, enlightenment, if there is a state of mind you can achieve where you become aware of being in the dream, but you're still living in this world. It's just like a lucid dream where you're aware in the dream and then you can start creating your own reality in that dream. The dream kind of just pushes you around until you learn how to lucid dream and then you can control it. Perhaps at a higher level of intelligence or awareness, whatever it might be, maybe people do have a tighter control over things that we can't comprehend or understand. I wouldn't know because I'm not there. It's just a thought that occurred to me. But um, the question is, and this is a one that's, you know, the whole world of AI and moving into the future and people becoming more connected. Uh, we're afraid of it, you know, like, well, we don't want, you know, be androids, but we already have it. We have people who can control artificial limbs using their brain. We have, uh, you know, basically, we're just a few years away from a complete robot body with a human head on it, if you will. I mean, it's, it, I just keep thinking of Futurama and the heads in the jars. We already have heads in jars that are stored in cryogenic freezers, you know, in liquid nitrogen, awaiting the day when they can be reanimated or the brains can be saved. So here's the thing. The question we come to is, is our consciousness in our brain? Or is it somewhere out there? And this is a big debate among, say, religious and uh, materialisms, you know, the idea that no, everything is just contained system, and when we die, it's gone. Here's the thing, I believe both of these can be true. That I believe that consciousness can come from the outside, but also, once your consciousness fades, this particular antenna fades away, if you will. And I say antenna because part of the theory is that it's this. Okay, if you don't, if you want to collect a signal, let's say, from, uh, you know, catch a radio signal, you have to have an antenna. And a certain shape and size and angle of that antenna will pick up a better signal. And it's very difficult to compare radio signals to, say, signals that would be coming in to consciousness, but think of shining a light through a prism and how it breaks the light up into pieces, um, you know, into its colors. And I, I, I think about this as very similar to the way that the brain operates, that there's a cosmic awareness that is using our brains as a, uh, a circuit board to create consciousness, if you will. In other words, Consciousness is in the brain, our individual consciousness, but it may reside somewhere else. There may be a universal consciousness. And one of the theories is that dark matter or any type of, any one, name, name your mystery in the universe, um, could be this collective consciousness that is all pervasive. Now, it may sound like an absurd theory and people would scoff at it, but the truth is nobody knows any better. I mean, how can we discount any ideas? If we don't understand what consciousness is and we don't understand what dark matter is, well, perhaps dark matter is consciousness. It's not too big of a leap. It's a huge leap, but, you know, it's something that's worth considering. So here's, here's the big, uh, one of the big issues I have here is uh, when people talk about transferring their consciousness into a body uh, or rather a, a robot or into the Internet or into a, a computer, you know, system, how would that be possible? And and here's the, here's the thing I'm always I, the way I'm considering it. You couldn't just download your thoughts and ideas into another system, because once you've made a copy of yourself, that other self would be a separate self. And the idea is you want to you would want to gradually 
transfer your thoughts into a digital system. And that digital system would have to be built just like the connectome of the brain. And the theory that I have here is that only certain structures in certain shapes can, I should say, uh, it's hard to explain, only certain structures can create consciousness and that consciousness will emerge out of these structures if the conditions are right. That would mean that even solar systems could be conscious, if you will. It pretty much, it's not a new theory, it's just a new way to me of defining something that I already believe, which is, a lot of folks would say panpsychism, which is that everything is conscious. And that's sort of what I mean, but it's a little more complicated in my mind, and it's something I can't really put into words very easily. But here's the thing, it, and rather than, if you want to develop a new talent, as I was saying earlier, then you can develop a new part of your brain which will take on the job of it. If you, let's say, lose a part of your brain, sometimes another part of the brain can take over and do the jobs of other parts. This means that your brain itself, the actual shape and locations and areas, don't matter as much as just having uh, the input and the ability for your brain to decide what to do with it, enough space to operate. Um, there was a little girl who had half of her brain removed and was still able to function. Uh, just fine, you know, she's seven years later, she's fine, she's a little bit weak on one side, but the point is that we are resilient. So what if, because I can mumble forever, but this is the, the main point here, when we do start wanting to, or, or deciding we're going to transfer our consciousness into a digital format to live forever, I believe it is possible. But what we'd have to do is have, let's just say, an external brain, just like your phone, an external hard drive, for example, that you carry around that is wired into your own brain. Your brain would have to recognize that as a part of the brain. If you could get the brain to recognize a synthetic brain as one of its own, then part of itself anyway, then perhaps the brain would say, look, we have a completely uh, empty area over here which we could build a whole new, you know, biome, if you will. Um, if, you, if you follow what I'm saying, basically the brain would gradually start shifting some of its thoughts, memories, and ideas into this new digital thing. So if, let's say you carry this thing around with you every day for years on end, and then gradually uh, as you age, um, once you, your body has disconnected, then the question is, does your consciousness reside in your, in your body still, or in this new device, or is it interspersed between the two? You know, even when we've removed chunks of people's brains, then they can still be themselves. However, even a small damage to one area or another can cause short circuit, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's where consciousness is. It just means that we've interrupted a circuit. So what you're doing is you're breaking a chunk off of the antenna so it can't function anymore. This would lead me to believe that consciousness really comes from, um, let's say, maybe not an external source, because that bring, conjures ideas of, of this God putting consciousness into us, you know, consciously doing it. Uh, maybe it is like that, but I'm thinking more, I'm thinking a little more along the lines of that consciousness is an emergent property, that the universe, uh, it, it's, it's part of the pattern of the universe. It's just what happens. It's what the universe was designed to do. Uh, that it's not just like we appeared on this planet out of the blue and as this fluke, but rather that everything wants to be consciousness. And the one misconception is that intelligence, of course, intelligence and consciousness are not the same thing. So what is consciousness without intelligence? And this is the hardest thing for me to try to comprehend in my own head, is to try to separate the two and say, okay, what would I be like conscious without my awareness, my intelligence, the things that I've learned? Um, the only example we can see is in feral children or, um, you know, I guess maybe some ape species, but even they've learned and they have their own patterns. But as a human, what are we without our intelligence? Um, and so how much of that becomes who we are, in other words? Is it what we've learned that makes us who we are? Or is it just a consciousness that exists separate from anything? That, because animals, I believe, are conscious, of course, but do they know who they are? It really depends on the size of the brain, but then again, an anthill knows what it is. 
and every soldier knows what to do and um, I believe that there really is kind of an underlying mind, hive mind, that we really are all connected as humans. The way that we read each other's faces, the way that we seek company and understanding, we are social creatures and uh, we suffer when we deny that. So it's interesting. It's all interesting stuff. Um, the last thing I wanted to say was about, you know, I guess the brain or the structure, whatever it may be, I, be, I don't believe that a brain has to be the right structure to receive any signals, but rather that the way that the neurons fire and the total shape and distribution of these things is what gives rise to consciousness. So the, it's, if you, I made several videos years back about cymatics and if you haven't, most people have probably heard of it by now, but if you haven't, look into it. You can take just sand and pour it on a what they call a, a child knee plate, and then you put a certain frequency on that plate and vibrate it. Or you can do it on a speaker. I have my own that I built. And the sand will start to take shape in a particular pattern. You change the frequency, the sand shifts to another pattern. And as soon as you hit a certain frequency, it changes to these different shapes. Years ago, when I was studying this, I, I came to the conclusion that several frequencies, inaudible, you know, uh, hypersonic frequencies, or a different kind of energy that could act like a frequency or a wave or a pulse, whatever it might be, um, might be creating matter. And I guess this would be the Higgs boson, if you will, that they've been looking for. The idea that there's, you know, one particle to rule them all. The one that, you know, makes things exist. You know, this cross point where things exist. It's highly complex stuff, and so I feel like completely ignorant when I talk about it. But I also feel like an expert, because I know that nobody else knows either. And um, so I guess the more I talk about it, the more I can be shown where I'm wrong or where I may be right or bounce ideas off other people to say, hey, what is this, you know, this thing we call consciousness and who are we as individuals? So if you consider, you know, the cymatics and the way that it uh, manifests these shapes, then perhaps certain shapes or orders or structures within minds or within brains or bodies can bring about consciousness. And if so, then if we can synthetically organize within the same shape, which may follow the Phi or the Fibonacci sequence to an extent, who knows? Um, there are proportions and mathematical equations that can perhaps uh, help us to structure an artificial brain. The question is, is that uh, moral? Um, would it work? And do we even want to live forever? Because I think one of the main things that a lot of folks forget is that what makes life worth living is being here now, but not being here forever. It's the same reason that when people ask me, don't you want to go to heaven and live with all your friends and family for eternity and bliss? And I say, no, I don't. Because it's life, it's life's conflict and experiences which has made me who I am. And I know this. I know that it's more than just a consciousness or an awareness. Is my soul or my consciousness separate from my body? Perhaps. But for now, it's entwined with it because all of my experiences have been had in this body, in this life. So I guess I don't want to transfer my brain to a computer, but it's a pretty interesting idea. And uh, maybe one day we will discover what consciousness is. I have, I have my doubts that we'll be able to prove anything definitively because it's just like the observer effect. We affect quantum physics. You know, we affect the quantum state of matter just by observing it. Um, yeah. It's another thing. We can't even reconcile our own laws. You know, the laws in the quantum realm do not even compute at all with the theory of relativity. And we're just stuck wondering, scratching our heads. So maybe some of these mysteries are not meant to be solved. We'll see. Take care, everybody. Have a good day.